With is excited to bring you this presentation tonight by author, film director, and producer Alyssa Knight, on protecting your application program interface or APIs. APIs translate between applications, enabling them to talk or interact with each other. I think there's some um, crosstalk going on, Nezi. Is that any better? Okay. The only one I don't see muted was Julie. I think that might have been it. Oh, maybe that was it. Okay. Yes. Almost We're everything. Here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Almost everything in our connected world uses APIs from banking infrastructure to passenger transport vehicles. And that information will be important to remember in just a second. So tonight, Alyssa is going to talk about how she's hacked them all and how to build a valuable tool chest to protect against API attacks. Prior to her career as a film director and producer, she was best known for having been a reformed black hat hacker. After her arrest when she was 17 years old for hacking a government network, she was recruited by the US intelligence community where she supported counterinsurgency operations as a defense contractor. She's the co-founder of the Knight Group, which is co-owned by her wife, Melissa Knight, which is a group of companies under the same brand, Knight Events. Knight Studios and Knight Inc. Before starting Knight Group, she sold two of her cybersecurity companies to publicly traded companies in international markets and is a film producer as well. Some of the films that she's produced are best known for producing and directing include Ransom and Scorched Earth. Those are both in 2022 and Underdog Games in 2021. She became a published author in 2019 with the release of her best-selling book, Hacking Connected Cars. Please enter questions into the chat or indicate um, that you have a question to the moderator if you're on site. And without further ado, please welcome Alyssa Knight. Awesome, thank you, Jane. So hopefully everyone can hear me. Can everyone see my PowerPoint? Are we good? Yes. Okay, awesome. So I'll quickly uh, skim through this since Jean already did it. Hello, everyone. It's nice to meet you. Thank you so much for inviting me to come today and speak. Uh, as she mentioned, I'm a recovering hacker, recovering entrepreneur, recovering CISO, and recovering CMO. Um, I don't know how I pulled this off, but they seem to be perfectly fine with it. I'm also full-time chief marketing officer for Defense and Tago Cyber, um, and <laughs> they understand that I'm a CMO for another company and also run the night group so um, don't know how I pulled that off but I seem it seems to be working uh, I started and sold two cybersecurity companies started a venture capital firm and I'm a published author of hacking connected cars and I'm in the process of um, publishing a new book uh, hacking APIs I'm the director writer and executive producer for several TV franchises um, we're working on a new series for Netflix and Apple TV plus and have distribution agreements with different um, subscription services uh, my research has been uh, featured in Forbes, Wired, Dark Reading, Threat Post, ZDNet, all of the big major trade pubs, uh, including Night Events uh, as part of this group of companies as Night Inks, Night Studios. We've also launched a coffee company, so you can actually have a listenite in a cup. Um, <laughs> uh, we will be shipping our first beans uh, and opening our first coffee shop um, in Las Vegas, um, and be, it will also be sold online as well. Uh, and we also are launching a new TV network for cybersecurity starting in January. So we have announced Night TV Plus, uh, which is going to be a new television network. And you can see the commercial for that on my YouTube channel. All right, so I just want to quickly go over my research over the last few years in hacking APIs. And for those of you who have no freaking idea what an API is, um, I'm happy to um, explain that. But it all started in 2019 when I hacked 30 financial services mobile apps, um, then hacked mobile health APIs in 2020, giving me access to millions of patient records. Um, in 2021, um, I also hacked law enforcement V 
vehicle APIs, giving me remote control of law enforcement vehicles, and this affected every Ford on the road. Uh, then in 2021, I also hacked Fire APIs, um, and uh, in 2022, um, also uh, hacked banks and cryptocurrency exchanges. And I will be sharing some screenshots from some of my um, vulnerability research uh, as well in this presentation. So for those of you who aren't aware of what APIs are, um, think of it kind of like Rosetta Stone allowing different applications to talk. Um, for On the consumer side, um, it basically allows software applications or websites that use APIs. These are, sorry, th so think of APIs as two different things, right? They're uh, two different sort of Lego blocks, if you will. So there's API consumers and API providers. API consumers are the clients or consumers that consume the data from the API, and the providers are basically the ones that build, expose, and operate these APIs. So I'm going to give you an example. An API consumer could be a mobile app running on your phone. And then the back end that the that mobile app communicates with is the API provider. And so there's actually different types of APIs. Um, there's public APIs which face the internet, partner APIs where companies will have software applications talking together and those APIs will only be facing their partners. And then there's internal APIs uh, as well. Um, and what internal APIs are is those could be just internally. Um, we're, can everyone go on mute? We're getting noise from someone's microphone. And um, so if everyone can go on mute, that would help me out a lot. Thanks. Okay. Um, so what is uh, an API? Uh, again, I want all of you to think about it kind of like a restaurant. Um, let's pretend that if you go into a restaurant sit down at a table uh you are the api consumer okay and the waiter or waitress who is taking your order and then taking that to the back end kitchen and and having your food made for you the waitress is actually the api okay and then the kitchen is, is actually the server so Think of an API like the waiter in a restaurant. They, it takes the order, it takes what you're asking, whether it be financial information from your bank account or your patient health records, whatever it is, whatever you're requesting, the waiter or API is gonna go into the back or backend server, request that data, and then bring it back to you. That is an API. Think of it like a, as a waiter in a restaurant. Um, so I'm gonna talk about my kill chain when I hack APIs, and then I'm gonna explain to you kind of what these things do. So on the kill chain side, reconnaissance uh, is the, basically the first thing I do, and that's fuzzing APIs and doing content discovery, and there's two tools that I typically use for this. Um, one is called Kite Runner, and the other one is Wrestler, and then there's another one called FFUF. Now, all of these are freely available tools that you can download from GitHub. You don't have to pay for them. Kite Runner is a very well documented tool and it basically allows you to discover things with the API that you may not have been able to find on your own manually. Uh, then I move on to vulnerability analysis, and I'm going to talk about Bola here in a minute, but the most common vulnerability I find with, with APIs is broken object level authorization. And so what Bola is, is basically I'm logged in as a user, but I'm requesting the bank information for Gene, or requesting the health records for Gene, even though I'm logged in as a listenite. And because of these Bola vulnerabilities, the API delivers me that data that I'm asking for about a patient that does that's not me or a bank account that's not me and I actually hacked 55 banks this year doing this and I'm gonna talk about that uh, as well um, but I want you to be aware of the term Bola Broken authentication is basically, you know, it could be, you know, a default password. It could be um, just no encryption it could just or no password at all. Or, you know, just I'm logged in as one particular user um, and, uh, you know, there's nothing, there's no controls in place to prevent me from becoming a completely different user. Or this could even include API keys that are not rotating and they're just 
they're alive forever. You know, um, one of the uh, banks that I hacked, it's API, the API token that was hard coded actually had no expiration. It lived forever. Its lifetime was like a hundred something thousand years. Um, it was uh, so that that could be in a great example of broken authentication. Mass assignment is basically where you base you, you can get actually everything from the back end API, um, all of the data. So um, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example of this and I'll even show you a screenshot, um, but just understand uh, that that could include basically more data that I'm specifically requesting. Um, the OSB Price Security Top 10, go check it out. It's a great list of all the vulnerabilities. Um, it's published by a community-driven effort at the OWASP, and it's basically the top 10 vulnerabilities for APIs. And so with BOLA, that is actually number one on that list. And there's a reason because because it's obviously so commonly found. With vulnerability analysis, uh, continuing down that effort, I also do mobile app analysis, and I use a tool for this called Mob SF, and it's a free download. You can go download it. It's called Mobile Security Framework, and what it does, it will actually allow you to take the mobile app, drag and drop it into the uh, tool, into Mob SF, and it will take it apart. It will t it allow you to actually reverse it back to the source code and actually look at comments from the developers. It'll actually help you find hard-coded API keys and tokens. And what this basically is, is the password for an API, if you will. It allow, it'll actually test every function. I perform network analysis, so I actually do network traffic interdiction, and I look at that traffic going from the mobile app to the backend API. I document every API request into a spreadsheet. So I push every button on the mobile app while I'm running it. And um, uh, I document that. I document what the API request looks like, what the, you know, what the API expects from the mobile app when I hit this button. I copy and paste that into a spreadsheet. And then I look at ways that I can manipulate that. And then, you know, like I said, with MobSF, um, I'll actually go through the application and look for hard-coded URIs, endpoints, and API secrets. And I'll show you screenshots from real bank apps and cryptocurrency exchanges that I hacked and uh, took some screenshots for you to see as well. Um, so on the web API stuff, so there's uh, really two main types of APIs I go after, which is mobile APIs and web APIs. We just discussed mobile, now I'm going to talk about web APIs. So within a hacker tool, uh, uh, not just a hacker tool, but you know, a legitimate tool um, called Burp Suite, it has different modules within it. And one of them is a proxy tab where uh, it will actually load up a Chromium web browser and send all traffic from that web browser into Burp Suite for analysis. And so when I'm hacking a web API, I will use Chromium and Burp Suite so I can hit that web API, find out every call that it's making to the API, API and then record it and then I can modify it modify that API request and forward it to another module within burp suite called repeater and so if I'm logged into a bank app for example and I'm using chromium and I pull up my list of checking my list of bank accounts it let's say that for example that get request for that list of accounts says slash customer slash Alyssa Knight, and it shows me all the bank accounts that are tied to Alyssa Knight. What if I go into Burp Suite and modify that API request to say slash customers slash Gene, and then submit it instead and see if it gives me back all of Gene's checking accounts at the bank? That's a great example of you know tr capturing that traffic and then modifying it, setting it to repeater and, and sending it to that backend API. That's a great example of that. Um, I like to call them woman in the middle attacks. The original term was man in the middle attacks, but with Widom's, I use uh, two different types of tools for this. Um, there's a tool called Midim Proxy that you can go download for free, and then Burp Suite, which is basically very similar. Um, and I use Burp Suite, which has a proxy capability built within it, as well as the ability to decrypt the traffic. Now, I want to say that again. 
with Midden Proxy and with Burp Suite, you have the ability, even if the traffic is encrypted, to decrypt it. And so what happens is if they've the if the app has not implemented certificate pinning, by the way, there's a way around that, and it's it's a tool called Frida. Um, I have a totally different presentation on that. But if they have not implemented certificate pinning, Midden Proxy and Burp Suite will actually allow you to load the certificate on your mobile device and actually decrypt that traffic. So you can see everything going to the API. So again, what what is in my API attack lab? Uh, I use Ubuntu desktop. Some of you are probably like, Alyssa, why use Ubuntu when you can use Kali Linux or you can use any of these other hacker distributions where all the exploits are on it? For that very reason, I don't like anyone building my system for me. I don't know what version of libraries are on there. I don't know what version of tools are on there. If you can actually inadvertently install two completely different versions of a library, I don't like that. I like to build my own system from the ground up. I know what's been installed on there. I compile all my tools. And for you ladies who are learning and you know you you really want to force yourself um, to learn this stuff, you know, I always tell people, don't start with the easy tools, start with the hard tools. Don't start in the graphical user interface, start at the Linux command line. Force yourself to learn those Linux commands. Force yourself to, you know, operate within the Linux environment and desktop environment if you want to learn. And and don't start out with the graphical user interface tools and, you know, Metasploit Pro, install Metasploit Framework and you learn it at the command line. L start with the hard stuff first. 20 years ago when I got into this, 22 years ago when I got into this, the, you know, there was no, no graphical user interface for these exploits and these tools that we have now. A lot of you ladies have a lot of luxuries with GUIs and with things just becoming easier to do. Hacking has really become point and click, but force yourself into the command line and learning how to actually execute a Python exploit, learn basic Linux commands uh, because it's the best way to learn. Um, so I also use Burp Suite. Um, I do everything on a Mac, um, my uh, Mac Studio M1 Ultra. I also have an API client that I use called Postman. Um, and that's actually free download as well. Midim proxy, like I mentioned earlier, and Kite Runner. So I want a graphic. I feel like pictures say a thousand words. So I want to, I'm clearly the girl with the purple hair is me. Um, and uh, what I like to do is I like to just use pictures to explain things. So basically the way the Widom attacks worked on me hacking these banks was I would run, um, you know, the, the bank mobile app. I would start it up on my mobile phone and I would use my laptop to sit in the middle of all of this traffic, which was being forwarded to the APIs and the banks, and I would capture that with my laptop, read it, decrypt it, learn how it works, and then forward it onto the bank. And then I'm gonna show you screenshots of what that actually looked like, um, and then we're gonna do attacking APIs by example. So I'm gonna first explain how I hacked these banks. So um, first thing I did was, like I said, I loaded these bank apps into MobSF, and what you see here are real screenshots of all these API keys and tokens. I've blurred them out to protect the banks, but there are actually hard-coded usernames and passwords in these mobile apps. And again, MobSF will take care of this for you. Go download an Android app, use a tool called APK Extractor, and it will actually pull the, the Android app off your Android device and allow you to upload that to a cloud environment and then throw that into, download it, throw it into MobSF, and it will actually find all these hard-coded keys and passwords and tokens for you. This is more screenshots of more API keys and tokens um, for many of the um, cryptocurrency exchanges and bank apps. There were so many keys and tokens and usernames and passwords that I didn't know how to show that in a PowerPoint. But you can see here, you know, barcode, there's third party payment processors here. I'm sure some of you recognize them like Stripe, you know, just API keys and tokens that are hard coded in these apps. Many of these vendors put on their documentation website, do not hard code these into your app. And if you do, uh, make sure you protect it and obfuscate it with the code obfuscation tool. Um, so this is a screenshot of me hacking the bank. In this example, uh, I was actually able to move money 
any amount of money I wanted from one bank account to the other and, and also change the pin code of any bank customer. So this is my um, screenshot of the bank. This here you can see an HP 200 success response to my attempt to actually change pin codes for bank customers and their card numbers. And again, this is over here on the left hand side is my Midim proxy window where you can see I captured the traffic and this recreated that API post request in post postman and so I just basically replicated each field of that packet and that I captured in midim proxy and I recreated them here in postman and then I just changed the pin number for that for that ATM debit card to a new pin and you can see that it allowed me to do that even though ladies that that debit card did not belong to me it was a completely different uh, customers pin, um, uh, debit card Okay, so this is my example of hacking law enforcement vehicles. Um, so before I get into this, I need all of you to understand what BOLA is. Um, so a great example of broken object level authorization is um, a, uh, um, a valet. All right, let's pick on Gene some more. So let's say I come up behind Gene. Gene pulls up to a really expensive restaurant in a Lamborghini, and I want to steal Gene's car. I want to take home her car. So I pull up behind her in a little, you know, Hyundai. And uh, I see that the valet gave her the number 18 for a ticket. She walks off and goes, goes to the restaurant. And then I come up behind her, I get a ticket and I get the number 17. I take a Sharpie and I change that seven to an eight. And then I come back a few minutes later with a different valet and uh, I give that valet the new number 18. He goes to get the Lamborghini and I drive off with uh, Gene's car. That is a great example of a bull attack. A bull attack is I'm logged in as a listenite and because of the bull of vulnerability, I'm able to request patient records that don't belong to me by changing the ID number of the request. So it's what's called an exposed object ID. So what I'll do is I'll capture that request in, you know, in burp suite. And then let's say I'm logged in as a listenite. I see that the developer mistakenly exposed the object ID for my account in the request and said, get, um, you know, I don't know, um, VIN number, uh, and then doors lock. All right. And that allows me to lock or unlock the doors of the car. If I change that VIN number to a completely different VIN and it allows me to do that, then that's a bowl of vulnerability. It's because I'm able to manipulate that, that, that ID, change it to something completely different and actually have the web server executed or the, and the, or this, uh, API execute it, which, uh, is a bad thing. Um, so what you're about to see is unreleased. I, I really don't want any of you taking screenshots of this and posting it on social media. So what happened was I was brought in by law enforcement to hack their vehicles. And I found a vulnerability that allowed me to remotely unlock any police car, any FBI, CIA, DOD, NSA, Border Patrol, anyone, as long as they were driving a Ford, I could remotely unlock the car from anywhere in the world. In addition, I was able to stop the engine or start the engine, and that was because of a bull of vulnerability. Here is a screenshot of that happening. So what I did was I found that they were actually exposing the VIN number and the request. And so what I did was I would change the VIN number and then change that to slash door slash lock with the delete verb. And what it did is that that verb delete doors lock on that VIN number actually got an HP 200 response okay back and it actually unlocked the doors. And I found that I could specify any VIN number and it would actually allow me to do that. So there's a, you could see my token in here and all that stuff. But again, um, what I also found was I could lock the doors by changing that delete to a put and it would it allowed me to actually lock the doors as well as long as I knew the VIN number. And we all know VIN numbers are very easy to get. You literally walk up to the car and look at the VIN number through the window. Um, this is my health, examples of healthcare. So here you can see a real report. It's um, uh, a particular patient at this hospital. It's a pathology report. 
And here you can see that they've exposed the patient ID. And what I did was I requested that patient information. It returned back a PDF file. Here you can see the top first line says PDF 1.4. And Postman allows you to save that response as a file. And then here on the right hand side, you could see that that's actually the complete full report for that patient. And um, everyone, this is a hospital in Brazil. So again, APIs are connected to the internet. You can do it from anywhere. So as long as I knew the patient, and I could actually scroll through the patient numbers. So I didn't even need to know the patient's name. So what the, what the developers did was they used numbers for the patients instead of their names, and I could just cycle through them. So it was like slash patient slash 100. I could change it to one. It went all the way up to over a million records. And it, it contained not only just their pathology reports and other key sensitive health information, but it also included their registration information when they were admitted into the hospital Melissa, so what i learned from mm -hmm. sorry there was a question in the chat Yi hung asked would a server side and database validation prevent this attack and i think you were on the healthcare hacking when that occurred yeah so you know one of the things that you want to do is in and i'll and i talk about that here shortly in the next slide um is you know you you just want to be careful as a developer not to expose object ids you know like when you're exposing object ids um like let's say for example slash patient slash 100 you run into risks of things like bola um you want to make sure that it's it's not really about server side um validation it's more along lines of if i'm logged in as a list tonight you need to implement scopes. For those of you who are using OAuth 2, you need to use scopes. So a lot of these developers aren't implementing scopes. So they're issuing a token for me. So I'm authenticated. I'm allowed to be there. But there's no scopes that say Alyssa is only allowed to access Alyssa's records. So because of a lack of scopes on OAuth and because of just a lack of authorization completely, um, developers are authenticating API requests, but they're not authorizing them. You need to understand the difference between authentication and authorization. And what they're doing is they're seeing that you have a token, so they just allow the traffic through as long as that token is valid. But the problem is, is they're not checking to see what data records I'm requesting and whether or not they belong to me. So good question. Um, so what I learned from robbing, robbing banks is despite it being 2021, developers still not authorizing authenticate API requests. We talked about that. Organizations are not maintaining asset catalogs of their APIs. You can't protect what you don't know you have. Again, you know, it's so important. I talk about this all the time. You know, you need to know what's in your environment. Uh, we're now working with an organization that has over 15,000 APIs. I don't know how you can memorize something like that. You know, make sure you find an API threat management solution that has the ability to identify all the APIs in the environment. <coughs> excuse me, and some of the API security solutions out there will actually tell you what kind of data the API is serving. Like if I have to protect 15,000 APIs, I don't want to have to worry about you know, protecting all of them. I just want to worry about the APIs that are serving regulated data, like cardholder data or patient data. You know, if you have 15,000 APIs, you know, maybe not all of them are serving regulated data. So know what you've got. <clears throat> There's still no context and security. A lot of companies, sorry, <coughs> my COVID is acting up. Sorry about that. Um, there's still no context in security organizations are still using WAFs to secure their APIs. Um, you know, it's it's really important that all of you understand just because APIs speak the HTTP protocol doesn't mean that you should secure them like a web server. You need to be evaluating and using API security solutions. Um, so it's something to think about. Um, a lot of the APIs that I've hacked um, over the last few years were actually protected behind WAFs. But you need to understand, web application firewalls were designed for a different time. They're looking for SQL injection. They're looking for things that are bad in the payload. When you're dealing with API attacks, a WAF isn't going to know Alyssa's logged in as Alyssa Knight. Why is she requesting the patient records for Gene? A WAF isn't going to know that. You know, you're only an API security solution would know something like that. So stop using WAFs 
Master Protector APIs. Use those for your web servers. Use API security solutions um, like No Name Security, for example, is one of a, is a great one. Um, but um, use API security solutions to do that. Uh, many companies are transferring their with their risk. One thing, okay, you're, everyone's about to freak out here. You're going to be able to hear a pin drop. Watch this. One of the banks outsourced the, the development of their mobile apps and APIs to a third party to develop their APIs for them and their, their mobile apps. And then that vulnerability that I found that allowed me to hack all those bank accounts, that vulnerability was replicated. That code was replicated in 300 other banks. So even though I hacked that one bank because they outsourced it, I now was able to hack 300 other banks because that same vulnerable code was reused by the company to develop 300 other bank apps and APIs. Um, there's a lack of penetration testing out there. Hack your own stuff, hire an API hacker. When you're hiring an API hacker, you need to specifically ask them, do you have experience hacking APIs? You cannot just hire a regular pen tester. A lot of pen testers don't understand JSON, don't understand APIs. They look like you know deer in headlights when they, they're looking at an API <laughs> or JSON. You need to make sure that whomever you, you hire is specifically has that that knowledge that expertise in hacking apis um what to do um you understand what's talking to your apis that's important know how many and where your apis are facing are they facing the internet are they facing partners you know are they facing internally know what kind of data your apis are serving don't hard code sensitive data in your mobile apps without an in-app protection like obfuscation there's some great tools out there there's even free tools like i don't understand how developers are still not obfuscating their code when there's free tools out there that allow you to do that they're just hard coding these keys and tokens in there and uh um i just can't believe it it's still still not being done authenticate and authorize test and retest shift left and shield right and that's it you survived my presentation. Um, this is the way you can contact me. If you scan this QR code with your phones, it will actually give you my cell phone number and all my social media accounts. So I like to have an open door policy. Feel free to reach out, text me, say hi, it's whatever. Just don't stalk me. Um, but um, you know, you follow me on social media, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and that's it. Um, I will uh, stop sharing my screen now. Uh, I'm impressed and a bit overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I'm sorry. I, I, if I talked too fast for some of you, I apologize. Um, feel free to uh, ask any questions. I'm happy to answer any questions at all that any of you might have um, and uh, or entertain any comments. Oh, QR code again. Sorry. I'll, 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 uh, I'll quickly share that. Um, so here's the QR code if you guys want it. Um, so that's my that's my contact information. Um, I I would say that I'm more commonly on LinkedIn. I would say I'm pretty much addicted to LinkedIn. Um, I'm in a 12 step program for LinkedIn. Um, so uh, the best way is to you know connect with me on LinkedIn and message me on LinkedIn. Um, I rarely check my DMs on Twitter, but you can follow me on Twitter um, and all of my new vulnerability research. Uh, that I publish is always published first on YouTube, uh, and, and that's really the best way to get me. What made you decide, after obviously being very successful with hacking, what made you decide to go back and do media production and writing books? Yeah, it was a really, I, I know it was a really weird thing to see on social media. So for those of you who saw recently, I, I've i decided um, to announce that I'm no longer um, doing vulnerability research and publishing it. This this actually is my, uh, I, I care a lot about the Jean and, and her team. And um, so um, I, I'm not doing technical presentations anymore on this. Um, I did this because um, they're friends and I wanted to um, support all of you ladies. Um, so yeah, I'm not doing technical presentation anymore. I'm not hacking at the command line anymore. Oh, you have to understand that I've been doing this for 22 years and I'm just, I, you know, I, it was a huge part of my life for a very long time. Um, but 
I'm a filmmaker now. You know, I'm, I'm working on a Netflix series. We're launching this new TV network. We've got now eight different TV series that we're filming. Um, and what we're doing is we're working with cybersecurity vendors to produce these very technically accurate cybersecurity shows um, and weaving their product into the story arc. Uh, so, you know, I really want to focus on filmmaking. Uh, I'm a writer, so I'm doing screenwriting. We just won our fourth Cannes Film Festival Award um, and Red Movie Awards. So, you know, we're I'm just at a different part of my life now. Um, I, I absolutely, um, you know, have, have loved and appreciated the last 22 years. Um, but you know, it's just, you just get to a point where you don't really feel like you're learning anything anymore. And, you know, for me, that's, that's my signal that I need to move on and reinvent myself. I mean, I'm running, you know, we're running a coffee company now, you know, we're, we're bringing coffee beans from Peru and Colombia and, and, and roasting them and opening coffee shops. So, you know, we, we really are just doing so many different things. I'm just not at the bash shell or metasploit shell anymore. Those days of trying to troubleshoot why an exploit isn't working isn't, isn't me anymore. <laughs> well, Sarah had a question. How do you feel about all of those trendy web development frameworks like Dango and I don't know, Laravel? React.js, Node.js in terms of security? Yeah, you know, I mean, look, for a lot of, like for me, how do I want to say this? It's never, uh, it's never the code, right? To me, that's just a means to an end, whether you're talking about Python, Perl, or React, or Laravel, or PHP, or whatever, it's just code, right? It, you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> this is going to sound offensive, but at the end of the day, um, you all know me, you know, I'm very controversial. So I'm going to say it anyway. Um, humans are the weakest link in security. And at the end of the day, we are writing code. And at the end of the day, that code will always be vulnerable. We will always hard code usernames and passwords in code because we never learn from the sins of our fathers. You know, we, we repeat the same mistakes. And um, I, after 22 years, it just doesn't seem to be, I mean, come on, we were hard coding usernames and passwords and apps 22 years ago. You know, back then, 22 years ago, it was website defacement. Some of you may be old enough, you know, old, you know, old enough to remember that I'm old. This is, this is hair color. Okay. This is a full <laughs> head of gray hair. Um, you know, I've, I'm 22 years ago. It was about website defacements. Now it's about for-profit hacking. Right. And so the, the game has completely changed. Now we're fighting ra ransomware as a service groups that are using those ransom payments to fund human trafficking and, you know, support the international drug trade. You know, so there's hacking has evolved into something completely different now. And, you know, until computers write code, uh, you know, as long as humans are writing code, it's going to be vulnerable. And whether it's Laravel or if it's HTML, it, it just, you know, it just doesn't matter to me. It's, it's, it's going to, if, if a hacker wants in, they're going to find a way in. Just, it just doesn't matter. You know, they, was it they, we always say, um, you know, as hackers, hackers only have to, you know, uh, was it hackers only need to get it right once and defenders need to get it right all the time. Right. So, you know, that's, that's the problem. And, uh, you know, you give someone enough, I mean, look at, uh, I can't talk too much about this, but basically what I will say, um, behind these closed doors, cause I know this isn't being broadcasted. Um, so when I was brought in law enforcement, what was happening was the drug cartels were hacking into law enforcement vehicles and finding out where the law enforcement vehicles were being parked at night and they were going home to their, their homes and killing their families. So this was about a year of my life, right? Did it completely free. I didn't, didn't charge them anything because, you know, I wanted to support law enforcement. And, you know, this was a very traumatic thing to hear that this was happening. And they wanted to find out how these drug cartels were hacking into these cars. And so, you know, I took what it took, you know, a few months, you know, to figure it out, but, you know, finally figured out how they were doing it. And, you know, the, the scary thing is, is that that's what is happening is cyber attacks now are resulting in loss of human life and safety. That's crazy, right? Did you ever think, I mean, 
look, you all saw the news report that 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 patient that died in Germany, she was on her way to the hospital. She was in critical condition. Now, some of you might argue that ransomware wasn't the direct effect of her dying, right? Some of you may argue that, that, you know, it was coincidence. It really, I argue that it was. Here's the thing. If that hospital would have never been infected by that ransomware, that patient would have been able to go to that hospital because they were down, because ransomware affected that hospital, they had to reroute that patient and she died on the way to the second hospital. So you proved to me that that ransomware wasn't the cause of her death. Then you had this other boy. Did you guys, did you ladies see the news? This poor boy, they just was, I think the news came out last week. He was in the hospital. Hospital got infected with ransomware and the boy was hooked up to a machine that was affected by the ransomware and it started injecting lethal doses of opioids into his arm and it was like a five he was what like five like this is what we're dealing with now it's it's a completely different game and i'm not trying to like the sky is falling it's the end of the world i'm not trying to do that i'm just saying like you know thing it's just a different different game now you know i mean the hacking units are now part of military units uh for hostile nation states it's it's just it's crazy it's crazy anyway i think i went on a tangent i don't think i even answered the question <laughs> basically it doesn't matter the code all the code sucks <laughs> humans suck Humans suck, code sucks, we all suck, it all sucks. And uh, hopefully, you know, we can figure it out before it gets worse. <laughs> so are there any questions from, before I take the another question in chat, are there any questions from the people who are on site at the elevator? <laughs> They're all sitting there like, oh my God, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> Oh, you guys can ask any question you have. You have me for 15 minutes. You can, another 15 minutes, you can ask me whatever you want. I'm, uh, there's no holes barred. We can talk about LGBTQ issues. We can talk about trans issues. We can talk about women issues. We can talk about whatever you want. There's no offending me. There was one, one other, there was a question in chat. I'm sorry, did somebody? Yeah, one in the room. Calling okay, me. sorry, go ahead. I just wondered if uh, you had ever helped with Criminal Minds or if you've ever met Penelope because you're you're even more awesome than Penelope. So. Oh, thank you. Um, no, I have not. Um, so we're, you know, we're the, the, I just, it is interesting though. The actor for the, have any of you seen the good doctor? The, um, it's the show about the autistic surgeon. So the chief of medicine, um actually reached out to me and approached me at defcon this year and said that he wanted to actually come and be on our set and be a part of the new franchise that we're filming so that was cool um i was like oh my god i love you i love this show like i you were such a you're such a jerk in that show but i love you um but you know no it was cool no i have not met penelope but thank you for the compliment it's very sweet have you heard anything about the CHI um, ransomware attack that's happened recently? Do you know anything about that? Because they're not releasing hardly anything around here. CHI is a health. <laughs> No, uh, no, I haven't. I apologize. I, I don't, I mean, unless I, it's tough because, um, right now, um, we've just finished filming three different franchises and now I'm literally minutes away from going to LA to film a new series in a private jet. So that should be fun. But, um, no, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, it's hard for me to keep up with all the lazy, latest attacks unless it shows up on my LinkedIn feed, like right when I log in and I'm like, oh my God, that's horrible. Let me click on that and read that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really tough for me to keep up with it. Um, just because we are so, um, busy with filmmaking right now and the new TV network we're launching and, the coffee company. So unfortunately, no, I have not heard about it. Sorry. With all of those. Yeah, that'll be great for you. You can go back to the questions in the um, chat. Room. Yes, Sophia. I think Sophia, Sophia has her hand up. Yeah, so um, 
super curious. I'm in healthcare and I've lived it. So I know it. And healthcare data is the most sought after data, just because if you hack a patient's medical record, you know, you not only have their health, you have their insurance information, you have their address, you have their billing information, you have everything. So kind of detailed. Data. Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's the most sought after. Um, and I've kind of lived, I don't work for CHI, but I've kind of lived through through that, like what we never thought could happen, but healthcare is also evolving in 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 the way in in the way data, the way we exchange data. So we're moving from traditional HL7 messages to more APIs, um, and with APIs, we're also moving to the cloud. So we're exchanging data with systems that are outside of the our four walls, so to speak. Um, I know you talked to you briefly mentioned fire APIs and I, I, I echo your authentication versus authorization quite a bit just making sure that we know that scope. What else, what else should we watch out for with these cloud systems cloud integrations. Um, um, even within the systems um, within the firewall systems talking to each other in healthcare. Yeah. Yeah, so great point, Sophia. So I don't know if you saw my research that I published called Playing With Fire. Um, there's a great report out that I wrote. I think it's a great report. <laughs> kind of, um, yeah. Um, you can go download that. That's a free download. Um, it's hosted by um, Approve. Um, it's a white paper that I wrote on how I hacked Fire APIs um, at the, at the um, d um, what do you call them, third-party aggregators. So um, what I found out, for those of you who aren't familiar with playing with Fire, what happened was... Um, uh, the ONC published this rule mandate that all healthcare payers and providers by a certain date deadline need to be able to provide all patient data and make it available through fire APIs or they were going to be fined and there were penalties and there was a deadline. Um, I said, oh, wow, that sounds fun. I'm going to go play with that. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I didn't have much of a social life before. I, I guess I still don't, but anyway, um, so I went after Fire APIs and um, I found out that the EHRs, EMR vendors, Sophia, that I'm sure you're familiar with Cerner, you know, all of them, they actually worked with me on this, um, hacked those, didn't find anything. But what I found was that there was this new, new um, market of companies called aggregators. And what they're doing is they're pulling health data from all these thousands of hospitals and providing that as uh, data and fire fire as a service. And so what I found was when I hacked the aggregators, I didn't have to hack thousands of hospitals. I could just hack one aggregator and have access to millions of patient records. And some of them are developers that are uh, making a fire platform available for developers to develop on. And what I found was, was that they were cross pollinating the data. So what happened was they had one massive data lake and they would make apps for different hospitals and healthcare providers. And I found a vulnerability in one hospital app and I had access to all of the other hospitals and healthcare providers they were developing for because they were putting all the data in a single database um, it, it's crazy and for those of you who don't know much about healthcare I'm sure you've heard of the evil H word HIPAA get this are you ready for this are you ready are you sitting down check this out so because it's outside the walls of a healthcare provider it's it's actually so this is crazy you're gonna get it's crazy it actually doesn't fall under the purview of HIPAA so, so, okay, so this is crazy. Okay, so if the data is in a hospital or healthcare provider or pair, right, it's under HIPAA, okay? But what ha what's happening is these companies are starting up and they're, they're raising all this venture capital funding and they're like, we're gonna be a data aggregator and we're gonna provide fires a service. And so uh, what, once that data leaves the walls of the healthcare provider and they end up at these aggregators that are these massive, just massive data lakes of healthcare data, HIPAA doesn't apply anymore. They're not under HIPAA because they're outside the walls of a healthcare provider. It's crazy. Anyway, so it turns out, Sophia, that um, I found out that two, so, okay. So the report got published. For those of you who are interested, there's some awesome videos on my YouTube, YouTube channel about this. And I actually published data. 
and um, the healthcare community exploded, right? They were attacking me. It was crazy. Like, they're like, oh, you know, they were attacking my gender identity. They were attacking me as a woman. They were atta- it was it was like all out war on me. And um, I got contacted by the Office of the Inspector General for Health and Human Services. And they're like, oh, we thought we saw your report. This is bad. I promise we're working on this. And then I found out that two senators actually referred to my report on the on Capitol Hill um, and it's forming public policy. So probably the coolest thing ever in my 22 year career to happen to my vulnerability research. But Sophia, I will answer your question, I promise. But yes, um, there's a lot of problems in healthcare. There's a lot of issues where government is saying, you must do this, you must do that. Oh yeah, fire, do that too. And we're gonna make you do it or we're gonna penalize you and fine you. And they don't understand. Like they don't understand like the the it's always technology and security is always an afterthought, right, ladies? Security is always an afterthought. And it's all about innovation and it's all about let's, you know, let's innovate. And that's what I love about humans. We we innovate. We're always reinventing we're always evolving we're always realizing maybe you know i maybe i was wrong before and and i and i want to learn and be better and do better and that's what's amazing about humans but unfortunately we innovate before we secure and that's what's happening in healthcare sophia so it's really bad right now i can tell you that right now and that was the most recent version of fire um go download read that white paper it's called playing with fire f-h-i-r not f-i-r-e and it's a white paper that i wrote where i talk about and demonstrate and provide evidence of hacking millions of patient records by hitting just one or two aggregators um some of the apis i logged into healthcare APIs I logged into get this are you ready for this sophia I logged in and the API started sending me thousands and thousands of patient records. I was like, what's going on? What's happening? Um, It was because, so this was this whole like, you know, mass assignment thing and whatever. But basically what was happening was the developer had relied on the mobile app to filter out just Alyssa Knight's records and it sent everything else for forward compatibility. And so what happened was, was I, the, instead of using their mobile app, I went into Postman and I sent the same API request for my patient records. And that's when I saw it started sending me everything from its database. I couldn't believe it. Um, in 22 years, I've never seen something like that. And so that's again, you know, humans being the weakest link in security. It's like, you know, hey, it, we're doing this. Um, maybe, you know, it's, it's some developer made this decision that, well, they might ask for additional data in the future. Um, so I'm just going to send everything so I don't have to do that in the future. I'm just going to send everything now. And then we're going to rely on the mobile app, the mobile client to filter everything out and show just what the person's asking for. It was shocking. Um, but yeah, Sophia, unfortunately, um, I don't have the greatest opinion about healthcare cybersecurity um, after everything I've seen. Can we and there was an explosion. <laughs> Sorry, what? Can we be best friends? Because this is this is a huge very, um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I've downloaded your white paper, but, um, and it's because traditional communication for healthcare goes, we, we send everything, um, HL7 messages, that's how they, we, that, that's how they work. You send everything and they, they, the, the recipient filters based on what they want. So, and we live in 1994 in terms of, um, technology because healthcare focuses more on the patient and the new technology is to t- treat the patient and not the communication. So as communication is advancing to more modern communication, we're, we're, we're starting to grow in that area. But um, thank you. Thank you so much. Super helpful. I actually have no friends, so I'm totally down with being your friend. Um, <laughs> people, people can't stand me after a while. Um, but no, um, so... <laughs> um, 
Yeah, you know, and there's a video. Graham Greaves is actually a very good friend of mine. Um, I thought he would be like the biggest jerk, totally hate me. He's like, oh my god, this is the hacker that's just like the creator of Fire. Um, and uh, he actually, we actually ended up becoming really good friends, and he's a huge supporter of my work. Um, but um, him and John, um, oh my god, what's his last name? John Murky. I always say his name wrong. John Murky, um, head of um, HL7 um, committee chair for cybersecurity committee. Um, there's a great video of all three of uh, both of them and I on my YouTube channel um, talking about the backlash from the healthcare community about my research. And, you know, um, like they were attacking things like the illustrations in my white paper saying that, you know, how could they take it seriously because it was full of comic, you know, drawings. And it's interesting because a lot of the people that actually attacked me when that research came out, um, I, f I went and pulled up their LinkedIn and found out they work at data aggregators. So they're, you know, it's, it's, cr it's very politicized. It's, it's a lot of BS. I mean, you know, after 22 years, you just start to get tired of it. Maybe that's another reason I, you know, I, I kind of left cybersecurity and stopped doing it because, you know, it, there's just a lot of more elite than thou attitude in the industry and you just got to have thick skin for it. And I'm just kind of over it. <laughs> <laughs> no, not everyone's as nice as you ladies. <laughs> Sarah had asked, what would be your advice for someone who's curious about cybersecurity, but doesn't really know where to start because there's so many specialties like cloud security, network general, cybersecurity analyst, and certification requirements. She says she's asking for a friend. <laughs> Buy my book. No, just kidding. <laughs> no. Um, okay. So certi to certify or not certify. Look, this is my opinion on certifications. Um, study, study, okay, getting into cybersecurity, CISSP common body of knowledge go download the cissp study guide or buy it whatever kindle it whatever it's a great book it's a mile wide inch thick it'll give you a, a, an understanding of tcp ip networking operating systems encryption it covers everything um it's a great sort of drink from the fire hose this is cybersecurity. um don't pursue certifications for the paper. Don't pursue it for the acronym after your name. I've interviewed a lot of people that were CCNAs, CCIEs. They couldn't tell me all the headers of a packet. My advice to you, first learn networking. Understand TCP IP, understand UD, the difference between TCP UDP, understand and memorize all the port numbers. Understand, you know, how networking works, um, you know, agent server architectures, just networking in general. Understand operating systems. You know, I, I had a script kitty once jump on IRC. I hate that term, by the way, but I had, a, I had a hacker who didn't know what they were doing, jump on IRC and, you know, after hacking a web server and asked how to restart Apache. Like, like you, you shouldn't be hacking anything if you don't know how to even restart Apache. So understand basic operating system usage, networking, um, you know, and then start figuring out, do you want to go red team where you're, uh, you know, ethical hacker, penetration tester, or do you want to go for, you know, blue team where you're defending and analyzing? Um, you know, I've been always a very analytical person. So I'm one of those weirdos that started out as an ethical hacker pen tester. Um, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I was arrested for hacking to a government network when I was 17 and went to go work for the US intelligence community after that in cyber warfare. But um, uh, so I started out as a hacker. I started hacking when I was 13. Um, so, you know, for me, that was a natural progression, right? But I'm a very analytical person. So I went from pen testing and said, nah, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to go into forensics. And I learned forensics and did GCFA um, and then, you know, did incident response. And I was like, wow, this sucks. Um, <laughs> it's a lot of sleeping in hotels and staying up all night, not doing this anymore. Um, so, you know, um, the fast forward, um, and then I started, you know, getting into SIM, uh, you know, secure inf information event management, SOAR, and, and doing all that. I mean, you know, you, you need to figure out what excites you because I promise you, ladies, I promise you, there will be days where your passion for either pen testing or blue teaming, whatever it is, your passion is the only thing keeping you hanging on because it's so hard. This is not a job, ladies. This is a lifestyle. I'm going to repeat that again. This is not a job. This is a lifestyle. This is not nine to five. 
you know, this is, and I'm sure some of you who work in cybersecurity can attest to this. It's, it's, you know, while we're sleeping, Eastern Europe is awake banging on our networks, you know? So you have to be in this more for than just the paycheck. Yeah, we're paid really well, but we work our asses off. You know, we, we work hard and we play hard, right? But you need to be very passionate about this. You know, I, I have people message me all the time on social media, you know, um, hey, you know, mentor me or teach me how to, how do I teach you how to hack 22 years of experience in DM over Twitter? You know, you need to read books. You need to go after the labs. You have amazing number of resources available to you more than I did 22 years ago. 20 years ago, I was dialing into BBSs. The internet was a VT100 shell. You know, th today you have hacked the box. Like we didn't have purposely vulnerable distros. If you want to be a web application hacker, go download Hack Me Bank. You have these purposely vulnerable web apps, purposely vulnerable APIs that you can play around on. Before, when I started, I actually had to hack real organizations. I'm not proud of it. I'm not endorsing it. I'm not saying you should do it. But the first network I hacked was a fast food restaurant chain because there was no purposely vulnerable anything for me to play on. So, you know, you've got all these amazing resources available to you. Use them, learn, and, you know, the idea of a cybersecurity influencer that didn't exist in the early 90s it's like you know so you have these cybersecurity influencers that you can also meet learn learn from um it's a, the amazing thing about content today is we have so much information and so much data at our fingertips now um it's just taking the time out to read it watch it and learn it That's a lot of information. <laughs> Have I put you all to sleep? There's like, I think everybody's like, uh, everyone's like, I need a drink. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, cool. So, um, any other questions or comments? You had alluded to it, but um, you've had sort of a circuitous route to get to this point. What has made you so focused on um, being open to women in technology and encouraging these types of presentations and things along those lines? Um, I, you know, I just, I've, I've been through so many challenges, right. In my career. Um, you know, I, I'm a, I'm, you want to talk about challenges? I'm transgendered. I'm a lesbian in a male-dominated industry, right? So I mean, it's it's there's been a lot of challenges. Um, so I have a soft spot for anything dealing with bringing more women into cybersecurity, which we also fund and um, are part of with like Night Dragon um, and some of the other venture capital funds that are involved in trying to train and bring more women into cybersecurity because it's a real problem. Um, there is just a huge lack of representation of women. I, I get so angry when I see security conferences and it's nothing but old white men um, on this speaker lineup and there's no women, there's no women of color, there's no anyone of color, it's just old white men. I can't stand seeing that. Um, so I'm trying to help change that narrative um, and I'm trying to do everything I can to help bringing more women into cybersecurity because we need you, you know? Um, it's, it's, it's just, I don't know. Women are just <laughs> awesome. We're awesome. And we, you know, when cybersecurity needs us, um, you know, when I feel like, I feel like the bad guy, I feel like the adversary wants us to be, you know, non-inclusive, right? Because how do you defeat an enemy that's bigger, more powerful and more resource than you? You turn them against each other. Right? So I feel like, Oh, I just got the chills. <laughs> um, I feel like the, I feel like, you know, uh, the, the adversaries out there want us to disenfranchise women, disenfranchise LGBTQ, because that just creates more defenders and, and that narrative needs to change. You know, um, yeah, the numbers are, are not good with women's representation in cybersecurity and I'm hoping they change in my lifetime. I'm doing everything I can to help that. Lots of head nodding in the room here. So, thank you. <laughs> Yay! Well, 
Could you speak up a little louder? I don't. Yeah, I, I didn't hear that. Can you repeat that? I said women think differently than men. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and that's that's why I feel like, you know, I mean, look, the best hackers I've ever met are women. You know, I mean, just if you look at the temperament of men versus the temperament of women, I, I'm not going to start man hating. I swear. I'm just I'm just saying like women, we <coughs> approach problems differently. We, we we everything is, you know, we're just I feel like we're more patient. We're we're more methodical. Where you know, if you look at the 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 comparative analysis, the idiosyncratic nuances between women and men, I, I we just make defenders a lot more capable with the things that we bring to the table that are inherent to women uh, that men don't have, and and I feel that um, uh, I feel like defense teams without women are just not as capable this is they're 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 handicapped i think without women on the team um but you know i so that's i'm i'm just trying desperately to try and try and change that thank you we really appreciate everything that all the time that you've given us and shared with us and i appreciate it's been great great chatting with you again and i'm so glad to hear that yeah. you recovered from covid before our meeting because you know it is sort of all about us <laughs> yeah 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 it's and and now there's this new omicron variant and we're just like like yeah we're flying to london and uh, it's i'm i just know i'm gonna i it's weird it's like if there's like a covid strain in like a 100 mile radius it seems to like i get it it's just weird it just covid likes me for some reason and i just keep getting it anyway um but look i uh appreciate all of you and i wish you the best of luck all of my love and support to all of you this is not easy this is not an easy job and and I'm just so proud of you, and think you're all masterpieces. That you're per, that you're perce just wanting to to do this. It's 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 such a tough job. And so um, you know, have your you know have your person that you that you just you know have in those cases where you know that incident response or forensics case is is just drained everything out of you, or that pen test has drained everything out of you. Have that person, have that influence, or have that someone uh, that can kind of help you through those lulls and and those those valleys. Because cybersecurity, you know, after 22 years, there's been a lot of peaks and valleys. And even still, if it's 2022, I still see, pardon my French, stupid shit being said on Twitter, like cybersecurity isn't meant for women because it's too fast paced. Like what? I like, I can't even fathom how to respond to a tweet like that, you know, but you know, it's, 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 it's 2022 and we're still seeing stuff like that. So go out there, conquer be the badass bitches that you are and go out there and conquer and and kill it and crush it and and show just show up show up and because you're amazing and you know uh i i believe in you and and i'm so excited to see this you know this new generation of women coming in as i come out and and leave cybersecurity seeing these women that are um just bigger better stronger than i was and you know that's what this is all about you know creating future leaders so um i applaud all of you well thank you Alisa, very much go ahead i, I don't yeah. you know, see me but at the live audience here i just this is pam and i want to point out that i'm aware because you and i and Jeannie talked on the phone first off we thought you're amazing tonight i can tell the whole audience has loved this but what the audience probably doesn't know and I want to share is that you usually do not speak on Tuesday nights and you adjusted your schedule. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. And no, I, I thank you. Yeah, I love you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Um, uh, yeah, just go forth and conquer. I, I love all of you and you're going to be amazing. You are amazing. And uh, yeah, just just. Yeah, thank you so much for, for everything you do. Um, I'm available to all of you for questions or comments afterwards. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're, 
looking for actually this is kind of interesting um so we're actually looking to cast someone we're we're going to be um having i invite any one of you to also uh get involved in this in a contest so you can be featured in our next tv show um so we're looking for someone in cybersecurity um to play a part in our new franchise um if you're interested we'll fly you out here to our studio um have you in the show um if you're interested in playing a hacker or defender or CISO. Um, so we'll be posting details about that contest here soon. Um, but yeah, that's just wanted to make that uh, announcement. So fun. Yeah. All right. Okay, ladies, I love you. Thank you again. You take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Thank you.